Diet is important, but circadian biology is even more important. How you live your life in relationship to mother nature dictates how that nutrient information is going to get processed in your system. So you have to get your circadian biology right first. So this is seeing the morning sun, hitting the receptors in your eye called melanopsin. That blue light detector tells the supercosmic nucleus in your brain that it's daytime. You start making different hormones and neurotransmitters to wake you up for the day. And then when the sun sets, that receptor doesn't see blue light anymore. The body knows it's nighttime. Cortisol will start dropping. Melatonin will start to rise. That cascade has to happen to have optimal health. Dr. Michael Twyman is a board certified cardiologist who focuses on the prevention and early detection of heart disease. He completed his cardiovascular training at St. Louis University after he completed a four-year active duty tour as an internist at the Naval Hospital, Buford. Michael, welcome. Thank you for having me. So in, in terms of cardiovascular disease, to get started, what are some of the baseline tests or blood work that one can do, should do, just to gauge their general risk of developing cardiovascular disease? Sure. And this is a topic that everybody needs to kind of become educated on. And it kind of comes down to two items. You know, one, you have to look at the biochemistry, what is floating around in your blood at this time. And that's what everybody's used to getting done. Their you know, traditional cholesterol panel, maybe their hemoglobin A1C, their thyroid. But you also need to be looking at the actual health of the arteries. And there's numerous tests that can look at the elasticity of the arteries, how much nitric oxide the arteries can release inflammation in the arteries, and then plaque. Because that's what you're really trying to prevent is plaque formation in the arteries, and ultimately the plaques that lead to events, heart attacks and strokes. So you can start with you know, the imaging first. You know, often recommend people you know, after the age of 40, consider a CT coronary calcium score. If they've not previously had known events, you know, they've not had a heart attack, a stroke, stance bypass. You know, if you're a 40 year old with just you know, maybe borderline cholesterol or high blood pressure, a CT coronary calcium score test, which is a low-dose radiation CT scan, looks for calcifications in the arteries of your uh, coronaries, which sit on the outside of your heart. You know, calcium is supposed to be in your bones and teeth. It's not supposed to be in your arteries. So if it's in your arteries, in any case, there's been some break to your arteries and your body's laying down plaque. Uh, I should say that the body's trying to repair that plaque by fibrosing it and ultimately calcifying it. So the calcium isn't necessarily the problem. It just means that the arteries are getting damaged and your body's trying to deal with that damage. So if, you know, a gentleman who's like 45 years old, his calcium score better be zero. Otherwise, he's in a real high risk category, even if he's having no symptoms. So usually we start with that test with most people. So calcium, uh, what about CIMT? That's the second test I would consider getting done. So the CIMT or the carotid intimal medial thickness test, it's an ultrasound of the artery on the side of your neck. So it's going to assess not only the flow in the artery, but it's going to look at the thickness of the layer of the artery called the intima. The intima should be nice and thin, should be less than half a millimeter thick. The thicker it is, the more inflammation is in that wall of the artery. And the more inflammation is in the artery, the more likely you're going to be continuing to add plaque to the artery. This Dr. Thomas sent him from the 1600s who had a saying, a man is as old as his arteries. And the CIMT test will give you that vascular age. So it's not uncommon that a you know, 45 year old man will come in the office, get the scan done, and be told his arteries are 20 years older than he you know, biologically is. And then the next question always is, is it reversible? And the answer is yes. You just have to fix you know, what is driving that inflammation in the artery and reduce the ApoB particles. And often the body is able to heal that damage and get that swelling to go down. The vascular age goes down and you're reducing the risk of having an event. And in terms of, so CIMT is something I do annually. Uh, is that is that a, a good length between tests for someone who's concerned about it? I'm higher risk because of family history. How do you think about that? Generally, 12 months is a good time frame. Um, I mean, if somebody does some very aggressive lifestyle modifications, aggressive you know, pharmacological and supplements, possibly you'd see a change in six months. Very rarely would you need to do it that soon. So 12 months is a, is a pretty good time frame. And then how frequently should one do calcium scores at once every couple of years, five years, 10 years? And obviously there, there's a spectrum depending on how high or low the number is. Correct. So kind of three buckets. If your calcium score is zero, probably repeated in three to five years. If your score is over 400, that's considered a high-risk finding. 
You never need to repeat the test again. You're high risk, treat you as such. It's really the people who are you know, one to 399, there's a little bit of debate of when those should be repeated. It does not need to be done yearly. So maybe every 18 to 24 months, maybe. But I honestly would only repeat it probably one more time after your initial one if it's above zero. Because a lot of the treatments that get initiated, you know, particularly statins, will tend to cause the soft plaques, which are more likely to cause a heart attack. It'll turn those softer plaques into harder plaques. So the plaques will start to calcify. So you'll see the calcium score test going up. And it doesn't necessarily mean that your risk is going up, which people will get scared if they see their calcium score went from 50 to 150 in a year. That wouldn't be a great finding as long as you don't have any inflammation, you have healthy endothelial function. Then it tends to mean that you're turning that soft plaque, again, that's more likely to cause a heart attack, into hard fibrotic plaque that's likely just going to hang out in the artery wall and not cause you a problem. Got it. And in terms of some of those labs, that baseline labs, APOB is one that comes to mind, I'm assuming that one comes to mind to you, and, and what else? That if you're concerned about cardiovascular disease, you should get these baseline labs. And some of these that most doctors, well, not most, but many doctors don't actually prioritize. So I think it's important to call out for people. Sure. And again, I kind of break it down into three buckets. You know, the first one's going to be about the endothelial function. That mostly comes down to your body's ability to make nitric oxide, which is a gas that dilates your blood vessels, prevents things from sticking to the artery walls, and things that would damage nitric oxide production. So we're going to be looking at a test called ADMA and SDMA. Look at uric acid, which when it's elevated will suppress nitric oxide production. Same thing with homocysteine. If homocysteine is elevated, very likely to have elevated ADMA levels and low nitric oxide levels. So those are the big kind of nitric oxide tests that you can do that are blood-based. Um, then looking second bucket is really the inflammatory cascade. So, you know, you want your immune system to turn on when you have an infection. You just don't want your immune system always turned on because it's more likely to damage the arteries in the process. So that's going to be the high sensitivity CRP, the LPPLA2, which is also known as the plaque test. If that's elevated, it tends to mean that the intima is inflamed, your arteries are on fire. If you have high myeloperoxidase, you likely have dysfunctional HDL. It's more important to know what your HDL does than the, the total number of HDLs. Your oxidized LDL, there's also come back and do an oxidized phospholipid on ApoB. And then um, there's a urine test called F2 isoprostane creatinine ratio. That's an oxidative stress marker. So that is just looking at, you know, is your body likely rusting from the inside out? Are your arteries on fire? Then, you know, you can look at that third bucket, which everybody is typically used to looking at, is your cholesterol panel. But I can tell you, as you, you've already, you already mentioned the word ApoB, if you're only going to look at one thing that's lipid related, you should look at your ApoB number. Now, the traditional panel is useful in ways to kind of guide you in thinking about treatment options, but it's not enough. You know, having normal cholesterol doesn't mean that you don't have plaque in your arteries, and having high cholesterol doesn't mean that you're at high risk necessarily of having a heart attack. It really depends on if their arteries are inflamed and you have endothelial dysfunction as well. But ApoB is a protein that sits on the outside of something called a lipoprotein, a lipid protein carrier. Cholesterol is really waxy, so it can't go inside the blood by itself. It's like oil and vinegar. So the body makes these lipoproteins, and on the outside of the lipoprotein is an ApoB protein. It acts kind of like a uh, structural protein, hold it together. In my office, I tend to show people a tennis ball. The white stripe on the tennis balls, the ApoB protein essentially. And ApoB acts like a key. So when it's, you know, being sent through the blood vessels uh, and, you know, your liver sending an ApoB particle to your muscles for say to drop off triglycerides, which are energy for the muscles, the muscles have to put out a little receptor and bind to that ApoB protein and pull it into the muscle cell and download the triglycerides, which it needs for energy. So particles predict risk, more particles floating around in your bloodstream more likely they could interact with your artery walls. It's kind of like a shots on goal analogy. If you have more you know, shots on goal, one of them is potentially going to get through. So if you have really high ApoB numbers, more likely some of them might get stuck in that intima and you know, kick off an immune response and potentially start developing more plaque. But what is a normal ApoB level? It really depends on what's going on with your arteries. If you already have plaque in your arteries, you're probably going with your ApoB number at least less than 80 but probably ideally less than 60. If you have completely normal arteries, maybe you're fine at having an ApoB you know, above 80 and not necessarily having to reach for pharmacological agents. So it's individualized to the person's you know, goals and what's actually going on with their arteries. And when, you, and when you reference what's going on in the arteries and plaque, are you talking about 
calcium score specifically or CIMT? A combination of both. Um, there's also another test, you know, a CT coronary angiogram that can look for soft plaque in the coronary arteries. So you have 60,000 miles of blood vessels. Oftentimes people get scans for other reasons. And if you see calcium in their aorta on a, you know, abdominal scan, then you know that you have plaque elsewhere. So if you have plaque in you know, your aorta, you like that plaque in your coronary arteries or your carotid arteries or you know the, the vas arteries and going up to your brain. So anywhere you find plaque, that puts that person in a little bit of higher risk category. And you're probably going to try to drive that ApoB down a little bit more. Got it. And so in terms of driving down ApoB, driving, or I, I'll just use that one because that one, I think if you're going to get one lab, I always encourage people to get that one because it's a better and more complete picture than cholesterol. Um, with all that said, how do you think about successful preventative measures in terms of lifestyle, in terms of, and, I, and again, I know everyone's individualized, but in terms of diet, in terms of exercise, in terms of stress, what are, what are some of the most successful pre preventative measures that one could take if they're at all concerned about cardiovascular disease? Sure. And I break it down to what, you know, something that's called like a four-legged stool. And most people are going to be, you know, somewhere down the journey of understanding that, you know, they need to focus on what they're fueling their body with. They also, I, you know, have ideas on what kind of exercises are probably more beneficial for their type of body. But you'd mentioned one that not everybody always focuses on is how do you deal with your stress in your life, both mental and physical stress. And the fourth one is really how well do you sleep? And that's probably the most important metric is how will you sleep is that's when your mitochondria are recovering. If you don't heal your mitochondria at night, it almost doesn't matter how well you eat or how much you exercise. Your body has broken mitochondrial engines and you're not going to make energy as efficient. So I kind of will break it down by each category with patients. You know, it's going to be based individual goals, of course, but you know, nutrition, you know, it really depends on what your mitochondria haplotype is, where you live in the world, you know, what is your current, you know, insulin resistance status, you know, are you trying to add muscle mass, you know, trying to maintain muscle mass, all these things are going to play a role in, you know, what you recommend, but, you know, high quality protein, high levels of omega-3 through the diet. Um, and then if anybody's ever followed me online, they know that I'm really big in talking about seasonal eating and, you know, more time restriction eating than really, quote, long-term fasting. It's just, you know, eating when the sun is out is key. You know, your circadian biology dictates how you determine how your nutrients are going to get processed in your system. You know, the second leg would be, you know, exercise, you know, a combination of resistance, strength training, and cardiorespiratory fitness. Third is stress management. I tell people stress isn't necessarily bad. It's just, how do you manage your stress? You know, everybody gets stressed in their life, but you know, are you good at training your vagus nerve to get you back to homeostasis? So mindfulness, meditation, deep breathing exercises, the gadgets are going to be more the like the Apollo Neuro, heart math, the do biofeedback, and then sleep. That's really the big one. And, you know, yes, a lot of sleep trackers are out there. I've used them all probably. You know, typically, you know, once you kind of figure out what breaks your sleep, you don't necessarily need to use a sleep tracker all the time. But focusing on high quality sleep just so that uh, you feel well rest the next day and have the energy to do things you want to do. So let's work backwards. Let's start with sleep and work our way down a diet. So with sleep, you know, you mentioned trackers, I wear an aura ring. If, if one is getting, call it seven to nine hours and, and they're wearing a tracker and their sleep scores are fine. And I think sleep, most people know if they're sleeping or not. I, I don't necessarily think I need a tracker. I like to, to dial into some of like the, the more detailed data specific to HRV and resting heart rate. But is it just, hey, I, I sleep. I'm going to be okay here versus I don't sleep. Is it, is it that black and white as it pertains to cardiovascular risk? Not necessarily that black and white, but you know, you know, there are a lot of concerns with people having sleep uh, disordered breathing. You know, they have you know episodes of apnea that puts tremendous stress on the heart at nighttime. You know, if people have you know high blood pressure, they have coronary disease, and they don't have other obvious risk factors for driving those disorders. You have to look at their sleep quality. So. Sleep apnea is highly underdiagnosed and definitely undertreated. Um, but typically, there's not a magic hour that you have to sleep. But you know, generally, you should be falling asleep three to four hours after the sun sets in your general location, and you should generally be rising around the time of sunrise. So that you know, the closer you can live to your circadian biology, the better it is. Um, but you should wake up generally rested. 
You shouldn't feel like you got to take a nap before noon. You shouldn't feel like you got to pound caffeine to get through the day and stay awake. And you should have the energy to do the activities you want to do up until the point you go back to bed. Sometimes it's almost a trick that you should think that your day actually starts when you go to sleep and you're basically charging up your battery or your engine and then you wake up and you dissipate that battery. Interesting. So it makes a lot of sense. I think with sleep, it's fairly intuitive. If we go to stress, you know, I mentioned the gadgets, I track HRV and I track resting heart rate. Are, th- are those two metrics at all helpful? And not only, I, I think they're... I, I think they're helpful with assessing how you handle stress, but they are they helpful in terms of assessing overall cardiovascular health? They are, and they're inversely related. So the, you know, the higher your resting heart rate, the lower your heart rate variability is generally going to be. So you can measure your heart rate without any fancy gear. You know, you can measure your pulse on your wrist or your neck, and you know, count it out for a minute. And in all comers, a you know, resting heart rate should generally be between sixty and one hundred. Now, there's individuals who are you know, more well-trained and they can have resting heart rates in the 40s and 50s and not have any symptoms. So there's no magic heart rate that's too low uh, to say that it's a problem unless you're symptomatic when the heart rate's low. So if your heart rate's 35 and you're dizzy, lightheaded, feel like you're going to pass out, then you might have a conduction issue with your heart and it's not just because you're well-trained like Lance Armstrong. But that being said, too, if your heart rate's you know, 105 and you know, you're not having any other symptoms, maybe that's just a normal heart rate for you. But a better marker of the amount of stress your body's sensing right at that moment is your heart rate variability. And your heart rate variability cannot be measured without a device. You know, generally it needs to be a ring or a watch strap or a chest strap that's measuring the geeky term is the RR interval on your EKG. And it's measured in milliseconds. So as you're breathing in and out, stimulating your vagus nerve, the heart rate variability is going to change. You're going to have a more variable heart rate. Your heart rate's not always going to be like a metronome. It's not going to always be 70, 70, 70. As you activate the vagus nerve, the heart rate is going to slow down. When you activate more of the sympathetic tone, your heart rate's going to speed up. So your heart rate may go from like 80 to 60 and swing back and forth. That's the variability you're looking for. It just means your body's you know, able to respond to an immediate stressor. Um, if your body is always at 70, your body's sluggish at responding to stress, essentially. And it's mostly about training the vagus nerve. You know, how do you get that parasympathetic tone back up at an appropriate rate? So it sounds like resting heart rate may or may not be helpful in determining determining if something is is wrong. However, heart rate variability, if all of a sudden it goes south very quickly, uh, that that is more accurate depiction of something that could be problematic. Correct. It's like an early warning, you know, sign, you know, it can be that you've, you know, coming down with an infection, you know, or, you know, you trained really hard in the gym that day and you just didn't sleep well enough the night before, or you had, you know, a bunch of alcohol the night before, your heart rate variability is going to be off that next day. It's just not the day that you go for your personal best and whatever type of activity you're doing, you know, just focus more on recovery that day. You know, it's been interesting for me personally, you know, I wear the whoop and I wear the aura ring. Uh, I've seen that relationship. I, I, I do have a, a rather high HRV and, and I'd say it's, you know, in, in the low hundreds and then resting heart rates in the low forties and that's for a, and I'll see if illness is coming, boom, resting heart rate goes up, HRV goes down and then they become more even for me. And it, it's just really fascinating. And I'll see it in early stages too. I think I had an infection about a month ago and I started to see it. But right before, it's fascinating how it could be a predictor of, okay, something's coming. I need, I need to get ready. Right. And the, the data initially came out of uh, patients who suffered myocardial infarctions or heart attacks. You know, when, after a heart attack, you know, you're placed on telemetry and they're watching your heart rhythm to make sure you don't have ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, which can be fatal arrhythmias after an infarction. And, you know, I believe this was done in the 80s and 90s. They were measuring heart rate variability on these patients. And the people who had worse heart rate variability had a greater 30-day morbidity mortality, meaning they had worse outcomes or they died sooner than the people who had better heart rate variability. So in real sick people, heart rate variability is a better metric of how well you're going to do. And a relatively, quote, healthy person, it's a little bit more nuanced. So you can really only compare your heart rate variability to yourself. But if you see a trend where it's going down, then yes, you got to kind of look into your environment. You know, am I getting sick? And it may show up a day or two before you actually start feeling symptoms. If we segue to exercise, all that all that makes sense in terms of stress. 
segue to exercise. In your opinion, in terms of cardiovascular disease, uh, how do you think about you know cardio? How do you think about walking? How do you think about resistance training? How do you think about yoga, Pilates? I could go on and on. How do you think about everything that's available to us? And again, I know it's it's highly individualized, but how do you think about everything that's available to us in terms of preventative measures? Sure. And it sometimes is overwhelming for some of my patients, you know, the ones that you know, aren't currently in an exercise routine. They're like, you know, from all these options, what do I pick from? And I first say, you know, figure out, you know, your time budget. Tell me how much time you're going to be willing to devote to this in a given week. And then we can design the regimen around the time budget that you have. You know, I will tell people, you know, walking is excellent. I encourage it every single day. You know, potentially, you know, walking at sunrise is one of the best things you can do. You know, clear your mind, get the light in your eyes, set your super cosmic nucleus, get your day ready. You know, but walking for most people is just activity. It really doesn't count as exercise unless you're generally losing your breath. You know, you have to stress the system enough that there's a adaptive response. So if people do no activity, want them to start slow and ideally work with somebody who can walk them through the exercises. So a good trainer, but I would like them to initially start with resistance or strength training because it's really about having healthy muscles first and then adding in the cardiorespiratory fitness. Generally, I recommend people do more zone two type training for the cardiorespiratory fitness. That's more effective at improving your beta oxidation. It's you know kind of training the mitochondria to be more efficient at burning fat initially. And then later, as you get your conditioning up, then that's when you add in more of the interval sprint type training. But Typically, the interval training should be maybe 20% of your maximal cardiovascular training. Most of it should be more low and slow where you're learning how to burn fat more effectively in your mitochondria. You know, I, I'm glad you spend time on zone two because I think it can get quite complicated, but I think the way you describe it is just being slightly out of breath. To, to me, a great example is just taking the stairs at a brisk pace. You'll get there. Right. And so let's say you talked about how much time someone has. Let's say if I have you know, a half hour, what should I do? If you only have half an hour a week, focus on resistance training. You know, you'll get some cardiorespiratory benefit doing it at that point. But it really almost starts with, you know, what are your longevity goals? You know, um, you know I follow Dr. Peter Atia, and, you know, he always talks about, you know, the Centenarian Olympics. You know, he wants to do certain activities when he's 100 years old. And so he's planning for those activities in the future and backcasting what he has to be able to do now to be able to do stuff at 100. So, you have to almost figure out, you know, what do you need to do so that you don't have this crash landing into, you know, your last year of life. You know, as a personal example, my, you know, my grandfather is 94 years old. He was independently living till 93. Now he's had multiple falls. His kids have to take care of him. You know, he's not doing well physically at this age. Very mentally good until he's 93. But he didn't plan for this. He crashed into 94. And that's not my goal is not to crash into the last years that I got. So focusing on resistance training so that, you know, you have that core stability. You don't fall down and injure yourself. And then the cardiorespiratory fitness is going to be based off what your other goals are. You know, for the real, you know, science nerds, you know, you can get into, you know, VO2 max testing and try to improve that because VO2 max is, you know, associated with mortality benefit if you have higher VO2 maxes. But for the average person, just focus on, you know, getting whatever more activity you can in the day and slowly building that up. You know, I'm glad you mentioned the fall because the statistics are, are crazy. I think it's one out of four adults, I think it's after age 65, fall. And if you fall once, the chances of it happening again are twice as likely. And Atia talks about this too. The, the numbers are crazy if you break your hip. It's like you have a 40 to 50 percent chance you die within five years it's something insane well, less than one year yeah yeah less than one year if you break your hip one year yeah. wow yeah. For, what 40 for, wow yeah. so segueing to so it sounds like strength training is a priority i for one want to be able to do some of the things i can do now you know i, I have young children i can pick them up now i want to be able to pick up my grandchildren um and i, I think you know from my point of view resistance training is coming back in, in a big way. Uh, not that it ever went away, but I think in the more, in, in the holistic world, if you will. And so I'll segue to, to diet. B12 
because to, to me, this is where the rubber hits the, the road in our conversation. So to build muscle, you need protein muscle synthesis. You need to consume a lot of protein. The RDA for protein is, I think, 0.36 grams per, per pound, which everyone agrees is terrible. That's if you're not active. And if you want to maintain muscle, you probably have to double that. If you want to build muscle, you got to get to one gram per pound. That's a lot of protein. And you talk to most cardiologists, there's, there's a general consensus that if you're concerned about cardiovascular health, you should probably be having a more plant-based diet whether 100, 100, 100% for, for some people in extreme cases, maybe it's 80, 70, but predominantly plant-based diet. And if you are eating a predominantly plant-based diet and you are serious about gaining muscle or maintaining muscle mass, getting that protein is very difficult. So let me pause there. Let's bridge to that because I think from your it, 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 it's true that most cardiologists probably would say eat, you know, eat a plant plant forward diet or plant strong or or how how would you describe how you think about diet? I always usually start with that. You know, diet is important, but circadian biology is even more important. How you live your life in relationship to Mother Nature dictates how that nutrient information is going to get processed in your system. So you have to get your circadian biology right first. So this is seeing the morning sun, hitting the receptors in your eye called melanopsin. That blue light detector tells the supercosmic nucleus in your brain that it's daytime. And you start making different hormones and neurotransmitters to wake you up for the day. And then when the sun sets, that receptor doesn't see blue light anymore. The body knows it's nighttime. Cortisol will start dropping. Melatonin will start to rise. That cascade has to happen to have optimal health. The stuff that we're doing right now, chatting over you know the internet, it's great to be able to get out these information. But this light technology that we're all, you know, essentially addicted to, changes our hormonal cascade. And so we have to get that stuff right first before people can really dive into the nutrition question. But once they dive into the nutrition question, again, it's individualized. There's no perfect diet for everybody because if there was, somebody would have wrote you know, the world's best diet book and we all we would be doing that. But there's multiple diet books come out every year. So it just shows you how nuanced it is. So you know, there are some basics, but I would first start with you know, eating a whole food diet is appropriate. You know, I don't think anybody's suggesting that the standard American diet is ever healthy. Um, and then really figuring out, you know, what are the big macronutrients and big things you have to consider? You know, getting enough protein is critical. Uh, that's something I always talk about with all my patients. You're right. I usually get a lot of pushback initially, like, wow, 90 grams seems like a lot. I'm like, that's the bare minimum people should consider. Um, you know, a gram per pound of ideal body weight is what you're really shooting for. And then I'm very big about getting a lot of omega-3s through diet. So that's mostly going to be cold water fish. So, you know, if somebody is a vegan because of ethical reasons, that's one concern. But if they're vegan or, you know, just vegetarian without eating seafood because they think it's the best for their heart, missing omega-3s is going to be a big problem. And supplementing omega-3s with algae omega-3s is not the same thing as you're eating omega-3s or eating a bunch of chia seeds and trying to have your body convert it into EPA and DHA is not going to be the same. That's maybe 1% effective at doing that. So getting the omega-3s is critical. And then the timing of your meals, you know, ideally you're probably only eating during sun hours, you know, from sun up to sun down, probably a smaller window is appropriate for some people who are sicker or they're trying to lose weight. And so... You mentioned the omega threes, and and something I've heard many times, and I'll just get your take. If you are going to eat fish, focus on smash, sardines, mackerel, anchovies, salmon, and herring. Best fish for cardiovascular health. Correct. Yep, those are good. And look, I, I agree. I think it's to your point. If there was one diet that worked for everyone, there'd be one book, and that would be it. But there are plenty of books to come out, and lots of interesting conversation to have. With that said, I do want to spend time on the protein piece, though. So. If you do lean plant forward, you're not vegan for ethical reasons, but you, 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 you know, you have, so me, for example, I find if I eat too much red meat, my numbers start to go in the wrong direction in a bad way. So I still enjoy, you know, a grass fed beef burger every once in a while, but it's every once in a while. It's not every day. It's not every week. So with that said, coming back to the protein conversation, if you do lean plant forward, what are some of it sounds like fish is something you can focus on. How, in your opinion, do you get that protein in a way that is healthy? And back to your question, I mean, 
that's why some of this advanced testing really can help guide the conversation. You know, you know I've also been on you know, multiple carnivore type podcasts before and people are, you know, 80% of their food is coming from red meat and stuff. And they ask me, is it healthy? I'm like, it's always in the context. What are your arteries doing with that information? You know, if you have a lot of inflammation in the field dysfunction, it might not be the best diet for that person. So there's a couple of genetic tests you can look at. You can look at APOE. If you have an APOE4 gene, maybe a high saturated diet won't work as well for you. And then there's 20% of the population that hyperabsorbs sterols in their gut. You know, there's a company called Boston Heart Lab that can do this cholesterol balance test that tells you if your lipids are abnormal, what seems to be the issue? Is it that your body's producing too much sterols or is it your intestines reabsorbing too much of it? You know, there's a Neiman one pick like receptor and an ABC binding cassette in the gut. It's kind of like a ticket taker. If that ticket taker allows everything back in, then some of these times these people will go, you know, be on these higher fat diets um, and their lipids will go through the roof. You know, I've seen LDL cholesterol is a five, 600 when some people do some of these diets. But if they switch up the saturated fat to polyunsaturated fat or monounsaturated fat, many times those numbers start improving. Or if they're really not going to change up their diet, there's medications that can close that, you know, that gate essentially, and the, the lipids are going to improve. So you have to kind of know what their context is to decide if that, you know, uh, test is actually, or I should say that diet is actually going to likely mess up their uh, cardiovascular system. But back to your question about the protein, yes, yeah, so you just, you know, always want to focus on whole food protein, if at all possible. But if you can't get enough eggs or fish in your diet, then I'm not opposed to people doing protein powders. And if you're going to do plant-based, probably you're going to have to do a lot of pea protein, um, because the other ones, you know, are probably not as bioavailable. You know, they don't have as many, you know, amino acids in them. Um, and, you know, you're just going to have to uh, really plan things out if you're going to do it more of a plant-based protein approach. Well said. And to your point, it, it is highly personalized. And I, and I think that's important to emphasize in the conversation should, is nuanced and should be nuanced. And often, unfortunately, it isn't in our space. Uh, that's why, you know, Peter Tia will say, we both listen to Peter um, he doesn't talk, he tries to avoid nutrition <laughs> and he's obsessed with everything, uh, but he tries to avoid that topic. So I, I'm going to come back to light. I think that's so interesting because it's, you don't hear that often in the, the conversation on cardiovascular health. And so, you know, should we be waking up before the sun rises? Should we be waking up when the sun rises, 10 minutes after the sunrise? You talked about bed. We should ideally try to get ready for bed, I, I think, when the sun sets. So w walk us through the importance of, of light and then also artificial light. What, 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 what do we know about artificial light and the damage it's doing? Sure. So, you know, this explosion of chronic disease, diabetes, heart disease, cancers, that's only a hundred plus years ago that, you know, this was happening. You know, the, the light bulb wasn't invented until the late 1800s. So before that time at night, the sun set, all you had was fire to illuminate yourself. So you had red light at night. Red light still can allow you to sleep because it doesn't affect your melatonin production. So melatonin is not a pill, it's a hormone. And it's a hormone that's produced during the day, but is only released during darkness. With our modern technology, especially having artificial light at night, we basically confuse the body into thinking it's still daytime when it's nighttime. So in an ideal day, if you wake up before the sunrise, which I do, I just wear a pair of blue blocking glasses if I'm going to be anywhere that's brightly lit. But at home, I have different red lights or I just use natural lighting in the morning to the sunrises. I have a nice fireplace that pick out my place so that I would have fire in my home. And then I generally go for a walk at sunrise. Just let that natural light hit the eyes and start processing, you know, the information in your brain that hits a center called the supracosmic nucleus. It's like your master GPS clock to tell the rest of the body what time of day it is. And then at night, start trying to wind down the technology to the best of your ability or wear blue blocking glasses if you're going to use devices because the color temperature coming off your computer screen or your device is 5,500 Kelvin. That's the same color temperature as solar noon. So if you're looking at your devices at 9 p.m. at night, you've just now told your brain that it's noontime. And when it's noontime, you're supposed to be alert. You're supposed to have high cortisol levels. Cortisol and melatonin are like sea salts. Cortisol is high, melatonin should be suppressed. If melatonin is suppressed, you're not going to get the signal to the body that it should fall asleep. But more importantly, melatonin is one of the master antioxidants. 
it's utilized in the mitochondria to have them do something called autophagy and apoptosis. It recycles broken mitochondria and helps the body eventually make new mitochondria. If you don't have melatonin, that improvement in the mitochondria function doesn't happen. And then it's like having broken engines. You know, you don't have any spark plugs in your engines and you're putting in all this healthy fuel, you know, it's you know, all organic food. You have bad engines. It's not going to process that fuel effectively. So you have to have healthy levels of cortisol and melatonin at the optimal times a day. And that's mostly programmed by the light information that's hitting your eyes and hitting your skin. I have to get up in the morning before the sun comes out and get our kids ready. My, my wife and I alternate doing this and drive them to school. It's dark out. And I'm very upset about this, the the permanent daylight savings. So I think this is going to be a disaster for kids across America, but, uh, but it's for another time. And so I'm not unique. A lot of, a lot of parents have to do the same thing. And, and some people have to commute. They just have to get up. And that's the reality of their life. So what should someone do if they have to get up before the sun rises and, and start their day, whether it's commuting or taking their kids to school or whatever they need to do? What, what should someone do in that circumstance? Sure. So I can give you kind of the, the guidelines and you just, you know, try to do as many of them as you possibly can. But if you're up before the sunrise right now in St. Louis, Missouri, the sunrise is about 7.15, you know, in the morning time, I'm up by 5 a.m. So, you know, two plus hours where it's still dark outside. So try to not have on your brightest overhead lights, try to use dimmer lights at, in the morning time. If you have blue blocking glasses, I'd wear them inside. When you're outside, you want the natural light to be hitting your eyes. If you're having a long commute, just crack your window. doesn't matter how cold it is outside. Let that natural light come into your car, you know, bounce off the windows and the glass and get in your eyes and let your brain know what time of day it is. Your body's always quantumly sampling what's going on outside. Then, you know, in the evening time, it's the similar story. You know, once the sun sets, start trying to dial down how much artificial light your body's getting exposed to. And blue blocking glasses. There's so many to choose from. It's often confusing. What, what, what are some of your favorites or do you have one favorite? Sure. And you're, you're right. It is sometimes confusing and there's a lot of marketing claims and such. And, you know, but the one thing is that, you know, just look for, you know, people who have, you know, an unbiased opinion on them, or at least will give you the specs of their devices. You know, the majority of blue blocking glasses can work, but they have to generally block up about 465 nanometers that wavelength of light is generally going to make your glasses a little bit yellow to block out that blue spectrum of light and then in the evening time if you're really having trouble sleeping the red tinted glasses tend to be more beneficial because they're going to block 100 percent of the blue wavelengths of light they're going to block most of the green spectrums of light so the red glasses block up to 550 nanometers. You look like the Terminator when you wear those ones, but they tend to make you pretty tired within a half hour, hour putting them on. So I just consider these indoor sunglasses. You know, it's reflexive. If I'm in front of a computer, these glasses go on. And which what, which brand do you wear? I'm curious. I have many of them, but these are my uh, Wolverines. It's from a company called EMR Tech. They make a lot of photobiomodulation devices. And I just like these ones. They're gold rimmed. So EMR Tech. Yeah. Got it. You know, you, you know, you mentioned it's, it's wonderful that you're in Kansas City, I'm in Miami, and that we get to do this. It's wonderful, but I'm staring at a screen all day. You're staring at a screen. How can we mitigate? Is it is it the the blue blockers? Is it screen protectors? Is it distance? Tell me how how we can all deal with this new normal better in a way that is not doing the damage that it is. It was a combination of all the things you just mentioned. You know, the first thing is the inverse square law. The further you're away from the source, the less radiation you get. Um, the glasses are more efficient at blocking the light than using the filters on the screen that are software based. Now there's you know one called Flux. There's one called Iris. Iris tends to be a little bit better than Flux, and you can dial out some of the blue spectrum from your screens. And yeah, we want to take a little side note. Like blue light by itself is not the problem. You know. We evolved with blue light from the sun, but the blue light that comes from your devices is three to four times more volume of blue light than red light. In mother nature, blue and red light are always balanced. And that's the problem. It's the lack of red light that you're getting from your devices. So you can add red light bulbs or photobiomodulation devices into your room. You know, people see me in my office and you said Kansas City. I train in Kansas City, but I'm actually in St. Louis right now. But in my St. Louis office, I have different red light panels in my office try to balance out some of the artificial light. And then 
for the people who just say like, I can't wear the glasses or, you know, I'm not going to do anything. There are companies that make um, either like plastic or they're um, like hard polycarbonate um, screen protectors. It's like the old school screen protectors. You just slide in front of the, uh, the device and then the light is filtered through that uh, hard acrylic uh, plastic uh, blue blocker. And then is there a benefit at all if I have the flexibility to, you know, taking a zoom outside, I'm still staring at the screen, but you know, I'm getting some natural sunlight. Is that, is that, but I'm assuming I get something from that. That would be ideal. That would be the best is, you know, or, you know, at least crack your window, you know, if you're inside, you know, getting the light in, it's kind of like the equivalent of like a fish tank. You know, if you crack the fish tank, all the water spills through the fish tank. Same way, the wavelengths of light are going to spill into your room, they're going to bounce off your walls and be hitting your eyes. So it's going to be better than not because glass by itself is going to filter approximately 40% of the red spectrum of light, trying to keep that heat on the outside of your building. So if you can take your devices outside and use them, that would be better for you. I want to come back to your earlier point. So it's your belief that it's all this artificial light through our devices, through our laptops, through you know Netflix binging on our laptops or what have you, that is responsible to some degree and I, I don't think we talk about this you know we, we often talk about processed food and you know, seed oils and there are lots of sugar lots of lots of villains in our world and you know we need villains uh but I, I feel like we talk about light but not in this context right and i think that's something that has only been really getting more attention the past couple of years um, you know, I stumbled upon it back in 2017 when I was taking a long flight over to Asia and I knew that, you know, the jet lag was going to be pretty severe. Uh, so I was just researching ways to mitigate the jet lag and came up across, across some articles that talked about wearing these type of glasses to try to kind of set your circadian rhythms more effectively. So that's essentially what jet lag is, is just like repeated daylight savings time, you know, falling back and springing forward, you know, your body just gets confused and the, everybody who's ever been jet lagged or, you know, the day after uh, daylight savings time, you know, feels that hungover sensation, you know, they're nauseated, their brain's foggy, they just don't feel well. Well, that's your organs that don't know what time of day it is essentially. And so that's when I really started researching how much a light affected, you know, your, your biology. Um, and there's a whole host of different, uh, um, you know, I call them, you know, light gurus and such out there um, that are kind of trying to teach people, you know, how circadian biology actually is probably more important than what you're actually fueling the body with. You know, food is basically, if it's done right, it's not man-made food. Food is essentially light information. You know, food is tied to photosynthesis. The sun grew your plant and you go out and eat the plant and get the energy from the sun, or you're eating the animals that ate the plant. Otherwise, the body doesn't know what season it is always, you know, you're decoding that light information through your gut. You're decoding the information when it hits your skin, the light, when it hits your eyes, you want all those, you know, um, let's say, um, surfaces to match your eyes, your skin, your gut. And food is just light information for your gut. Essentially, if you want to really break it down to that. So that's why I'm really just getting more interested in how the quantum world really works. You know, how does this food get broken down and processed through your mitochondria? Because your mitochondria, the organelles in your cells that make energy for you, that's really the name of the game. You know, there's been reports, you know, from uh, Dr. Doug Wallace from the Children Hospital of Philadelphia. He's the uh, researcher that discovered that mitochondria were only inherited from your mother. He has researched that approximately 80% of diseases have some major influence when people have mitochondrial dysfunction or mitochondria that don't make enough energy for those people. So your heart and brain are two of the most mitochondrial dense organs. So if you really want to be reductionist, is what do you need to do to have healthy mitochondria? You have to have healthy circadian rhythms. You have to sleep well. You have to get your light information right. So that's why this is going to be really kind of the things that people probably for the next five, 10 years, really are going to start learning much more about how it affects their health. And so in terms of light, something you've talked about and I think is interesting and emerging is red light therapy. Tell us more about red light therapy that has you so encouraged about that modality. Sure. So red light therapy or, you know, the scientific term now they use is photobiomodulation, you know, utilizing light to change your biology it used to be known as LLLT or low level light therapy. But the major source or target of treatment of red light therapy is the mitochondria. That red and infrared light penetrates your skin and gets into the mitochondria. For the real science geeks out there, it activates the cytochrome 
number four, it kicks off nitric oxide from that cytochrome, improves electron flow through the electron transport chain. It then stimulates ATP production. It helps lower inflammation. It improves blood flow to the tissues. So the majority of the data on photobiomodulation is targeted towards musculoskeletal uh, conditions. There's you know, over 3,000 publications. There might be even more than 5,000 the last time I checked. But you know, musculoskeletal conditions were where the research initially came out of. A lot of the data came out of Russia and Germany. And because of the Cold War, a lot of that information wasn't translated initially into the West, but it's now really starting to pick up. NASA really helped uh, break through a lot of the, the research in the late 90s. They were putting red light panels up in the um, space station. They were using LEDs and they were able to show that the LEDs will have a similar effect on photobiomodulation than the laser therapy did. So it became cheaper to use these type of devices. And now there's a whole host of consumer facing devices people have access to. So you can use these devices to treat a musculoskeletal injury. There's people that use it before the exercise so that it actually helps with endurance. It doesn't necessarily make them stronger, but they tend to have more endurance because you're putting energy into the system without having to eat to put energy into the system. And so can you like paint a picture of what red light therapy actually is for people so they can kind of wrap their heads around what we're talking about? Sure. So, I mean, I, I joke, it's a, it's a slump plement. It's, it's almost a sad thing that we actually have to have these red light therapy devices because we all have free access to the sun if we would just use it appropriately. So, you know, if you have access to sunlight, you don't necessarily need to be using these red light panels. But if you have them, you know, most of them are going to be, you know, either a, you know, one foot by one foot panel, there's half body panels, there's full size body panels. Yeah, I'm a kind of a red light, you know, geek. So I might have, I have red light helmets, I have red light watches, I have patches, I have, you know, all sorts of different uh, modalities, but most people will have a, um, a device. It's going to be, you know, smaller than your TV and you plug it into the wall for most part and you stand in front of it. And then that red and infrared light penetrates your cells. And that's where the magic happens. It's mostly affecting the mitochondria, making more energy. Got it. And so for those who have access to abundant sunlight, sunglasses, should, should we be wearing sunglasses when we go outside and it's sunny out? It's a great question. The default answer should be no, because it's a circadian disruptor. You know, if you put sunglasses on your eyes, that light information that hits those receptors in the back of the eyes is going to be different than the light that's hitting your skin. And that mismatch of information will confuse the body on what time of day it is. Now, that's not saying never wear sunglasses, but the default should be no. The times you consider them, you know, you're out on the water and the water, you know, glares in your face and you're just absolutely blinded. You know, you're skiing and you're blinded. You know, you're driving and the sun's right in your face. Fine, put them on. But at the time that it's appropriate, the default should be they should come off because you want to have full spectrum light coming into your eyes. You know, I think of all the great takeaways we've had today, that might just be the one that's going to blow people's minds in terms of in terms of their relationship to their sunglasses. Because it sounds like you should use them when you really need to see and the sun is obstructing your eyesight, you know, driving, skiing, out in the water, you, you know, there's a glare you can't see. But otherwise, if you're going for a walk and, you know, it's a little sunny or maybe a lot of sunny out, don't use them. Right. And it's, I always get the question like, well, my eyes tear up. I'm very sensitive to the light and be like, check me too. You know, I was addicted to sunglasses. I'll, I'll admit it. I had some very fancy pairs of sunglasses, but you know, over time your body becomes used to it. And the way you actually get used to it is you get that morning light in the morning. There's no UV, you know, getting through the atmosphere. So you're just mostly getting the other colors of light. A lot of it's, you know, red from sun up to sundown, there's red light. The red light conditions the eyes and gets them ready for when that UV light comes out later in the day. And if you do this long enough, you precondition the eyes enough that your eyes will stop tearing you know, after a week or two, and you can slowly build up your kind of callus to that light. I feel like the sun needs a new PR team. Probably. I mean, <laughs> but the, the funny part is like we evolved under full spectrum sun. All the animals respond to it. We're the only kind of silly you know, talking monkeys that move inside and use these artificial wavelengths, these artificial suns. And then we get, you know, frustrated that we get these diseases, which always get attributed to either too much sun or lack of sun. And most people have a lack of sun. It's very rare that people get too much sun. In, in terms of too much, is it, you know, I always have that, that image in the back of my mind is, 
you know, someone laying out in the middle of the day, you know, putting on not even the, the sunscreen, the, the tanning lotion. They, they just can't get enough uh, basking in the sun for hours at a time. But, but that, that's my image of, of too much. What, what, is, is that accurate? Correct. I mean, you do have to, you know, build yourself up for this. And, you know, this will probably like frustrate my, you know, dermatology colleagues, you know, who want to think that the sun is a poison for everybody at all times and should always be covered up. No, your skin is a photodynamic surface, you know, but you do need to use common sense. You know, if you get morning light on your skin, you get that red healing light on your skin in the morning time, it's preconditioned for when the UV comes out later in the day. And then if you're outside at sunset and the UV goes on, gone away, that red light therapy, you know, either from the sun or a red light panel can help somewhat treat something if you've overdone your sun exposure for the day. And there's apps that can kind of help you learn, you know, what your Fitzpatrick skin type is, because if you're a blonde haired Irish person versus somebody who's from the equator with very dark skin and has a lot of melanin, they need vastly different quantities of sunlight. So it is not a one size fits all situation, but it's like many things in life, it's moderation and you start slow and build yourself up. Well said. And so in terms of all the emerging science out there, I think we live in a very exciting time and there's studies coming out every day, whether it's on, uh, you know, lately I've seen a lot on the power of walking. I've seen a lot of zone two training, uh, a lot on coffee. I feel like co we're, we're there on coffee. Coffee's, coffee's great. Uh, filtered coffee to be specific uh with all the emerging science what are you paying attention to what do you think is interesting i really think it's going to come down to the the quantum health information you know how do mitochondria actually sense the environment how do mitochondria actually make efficient energy for you and when you can really start understanding how that works then you can decide how you can start fixing things in your environment because the greatest majority of diseases are not genetic. You're not destined to get certain diseases. It's something epigenetic. It's something in your environment that's triggering things to turn on in your body that are causing maladaptive responses. And so if you really figure out what breaks mitochondria, you can then interfere with that process. And when you say environment, for some people that could be food, for others that could be light, for others it could be stress. That's a, just to make sure we're saying the same thing. Correct. How far away do you think we are on that? I think it's coming. Um, you know, if people want to, you know, fact check me, go go look at you know, Doug Wallace's information. You know, he's probably will win the Nobel Prize for Medicine someday for all of the research he's done on mitochondrial health. You know, he has great YouTube videos out there that you know really lay out the science on how these chronic diseases really started kicking up when people's mitochondria became less efficient. Fascinating. And is there a good way for people to, to gauge? how they're doing in terms of their mitochondrial health essentially it's you know it's about energy you know life is about time and energy so do you have the energy to do all the things you want to do you know is your brain working at 100 percent, you know max capacity you know do you have the energy that you want to play with your kids or to do the workouts you want to do if you do you probably have good what's called redox potential you have good ability to make energy in your mitochondria but if you have chronic fatigue you don't sleep well you're just dragging all the time your mind is foggy you know, you get chronic infections all the time. Then you probably have poor redox potential. That's a sign that your mitochondria are not efficient at making energy for you. So you kind of know intuitively, you know, if they're working well or not. The hard part sometimes is figuring out what is breaking them. But the, the basics are, you know, see sunrises, set your super cosmetic nucleus, you know, eat a whole food based diet, high in omega 3s, get your protein for your muscle. You know, do some type of physical activity daily, manage your stress, and then focus on your sleep. You know, do the basics. What a great way to close. I agree with everything you just said. Michael, thank you so much. Thank you for having me today.